Welcome to the Service MVP Podcast, and my name is Joe Crisera, America's Service Sales Coach, and we have with us one of my very best friends, John Nevis, Jonathan Nevis, who is from Green Energy uh, near Boston, Massachusetts. John, say hi to everybody, please. Hey, welcome. It's a pleasure. I'm, I'm super excited. Yeah, me too, me too, and uh, definitely, uh, you know, John, uh, it's like one of these people that you, the first day I seen you and the first day I met you, I'm like, man, uh, easy. I would say the easiest thing I ever did was fall in love with you and your team. You know, so many great people that you have seen uh, on your behalf speaking about the culture of green energy. Uh, one of the things I noticed, though, John, is uh, every time I look around, every time I turn to look at your page, it's like some new award that your team is winning of some sort. And that kind of leads me to believe that education is one of the things you believe in. Could you talk a little bit about that, John, and just a little bit about how education has kind of formed uh, the culture of your company? You know, it's it's funny because people talk about culture so much and and they'll talk about like ping pong tables and, you know, uh, snacks and stuff. And we don't have any of those things, but our culture is awesome. And I, I really feel like it wasn't, I didn't sit here and go, we have to have a great culture, but it just came back to saying like, I'm like, Hey, you know what? I'm just going to like really heavily invest in these guys and, and constantly help them to be better, you know? And I feel like it, it's, it's a slower ROI. It's taken longer, but once it started to really take off, it, it's just exponential at this point. And, um, you know, the retention rate is is wild. I mean, just before I started this podcast, one of my top guys is telling me about another person they wanted to bring over. So it's just like it spreads and other people are hearing about it. And it just creates this really great work culture where people know that, you know, the owners not only care, but they're heavily invested in your success. And so I, I feel like tra- it all comes back to training. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think, I think you're right. I think the thing about the uh, snacks and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, we have the same thing here too. But truthfully, uh, no matter how well you do those kind of fun and games, uh, you know, you got to put the work in with the employees to educate yourself and them. And, uh, you know, when you do the education, I assume it's not just give it to them. It's like you yourself are uh, going through that. How important is that the leader themselves go through that, go through the same thing that their people are going through? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I tell everyone the same thing here. I'm like, you know, like this year, we're going to do probably over a little over 10 million, it looks like. Um, I've never ran a $10 million company before. <laughs> so the only way I know how to do that is to reach out to other people to that have done it, that have worked with people that have done it, like Service MVP and other, and other uh, establishments, and take as much information as possible. Because, you know, my thing is the more we grow, it's the more I have to give. And I can only give what I put into myself. So I am like an information whore. Like I'm always, uh-huh, uh-huh. somebody has something, some information I need, and I'm finding it. That's that's my philosophy. You dive into it, uh, John. Let's talk about the three keys. Uh, you you started out as a company that was well. When I when I first met you, I mean, well, how much were you doing? You're doing about running. You're running running at about ten million right now. That rate of ten million. What were you doing when we first met? How much money was uh, when you first saw us, or when under we first came first on the scene? How much? Under a million. So under a million, and how many years would that you say we're taking from under a million to ten years? What would ten uh, million you think we're looking at? Well, the first while I, I I took the information and I didn't even use it. I just put it in a shelf. And uh, that's it right. I remember I, you, you came to a training and you I'm like, hey, is and then then he came back and said I came to it and then you put it on the shelf and didn't use it. You told me that story already. Yeah, I thought it was stupid. I was, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> this is never work. And I literally I just I think it was like 2015 or something, and I was like. Yeah, this is stupid. I'm not doing this. And I didn't do it for like, it wasn't until like 2018 that I even was like, hey, wait a minute. I have an idea. Like it was my idea. Like, (laughs) hey, I know what we should do. Start making premium mid-range economy options and magic moments. And uh, you know what? Yeah. Well, I think I told you this already, but I had a customer and uh, they were like, we want the cheapest option. I'm like, I got you. I'm the cheap, like I'm the cheap guy all day. Mm -hmm. Nobody could beat me. And so I walked in and I gave them the craziest crackhead cheap price you could give anyone. And uh, I, they didn't sign. And then a week later, I'm like, you know, Jim, he has to move forward. I called him up. He's like, yeah, I went with this other company. They actually sold me a 97% modulating furnace and a heat pump and all this. I'm like, wait a minute. You told me you just wanted air conditioning. You wanted the cheapest price. And you went with this. And that's when it was the aha moment for me. And it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me that call. 
because I literally, I, I have it right here. I, I went back and grabbed my it, total immersions folder and I started ripping out all the pages, made a ton of copies and folders and just kind of went through the whole training again myself. And from there, uh, in 2019, we we were at a million. So from 2019 to 2023, we went from like a million to 10 million. Wow, Jen, uh, I'm so proud of you. You know what? Uh, it does take, sometimes it does take time. It's like you plant the seed and that seed was just didn't have any, you know, sometimes the fertilizer of that seed is when, when you get angry enough at something, you're like, that's it. We're going to learn. <laughs> that's for me. It was the same thing. It was like, ah, I can't believe where I'm at right now. And I kept losing these jobs and you, know, you can never sustain a, uh, you can't, you cannot sustain a competitive advantage based on a lower price. I think we all, you now realize that, right? Uh, but you know, I don't worry about it. Cause I was a hard head too, like you. So that's why you remind me of a young me, uh, when I, when I was going through the same thing, I did the same thing and I'm like, wow, man, I had this information and I just never used it and things. I even had the books and the price books and everything I created the same way, but I just never started it. But then I did get going on it. Well, John, thanks for doing it. Now let's talk about the three keys that you think, uh, okay. for a service business, uh, to get to that point to, you know, if you're going to give advice to some of the young, young man who was out there. Uh, who's at 1 million right now or 2 million right now, what advice would you give? Let's start with step one. What do you think step one would be uh, in your cycle that started building this thing from the 1 million company that was, uh, you know, just trying to piece it together to a $10 million company that is now an enterprise. Tell me about that. What's the first yeah. step? The first step 100% is training. Like we have tech training. We do like interplay training. We have a very small uh, physical training area where we have equipment. Um, but 100%, the, you know, I tell these guys probably every day that we have, and that's the other thing we meet every day, but during those meetings, we're training. And during those trainings, I tell them the same thing, like where you want to be, or excuse me, where you are and where you want to be, there's a gap. And in between that gap, it's filled with communication skills. And the wow. only way you're going to get there is increasing your communication skills. I can only pay you so much to turn a wrench you're like, what am I going to give you another dollar an hour? What are you going to do with that? You can ex exponentially increase your income to whatever you want, but that gap has to be filled with communication skills. So to me, it's that's hands down the most important invest in their training and investing in their communication skills. And then, well, thanks. I think we <clears throat> definitely, I think is a key component. Number two uh, was a very surprising one. Uh, you would, I would think that everybody would realize this, but uh, it was about the service and the sales team. Uh, but the, uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, balance between service and sale, service and equipment uh, when you first started. This is number two, which is what, John? What do you think there is there? Yeah, a strong service department that has a really good lead turnover process. Um, we found this out, honestly, uh, this year. We had a, uh, well, I shouldn't say this year, last year, end of last year, we had a horrible lead turnover process and a not so great of a service department um, because we were just doing so well with install. We didn't really think about it. And we started investing heavily starting around December, January. And we started really focusing on these lead, turn lead turnovers. And what we found is even during a down economy, we're way up over what we were last year, um, mainly because our we're getting really what I call it is getting leads off market. You know, like if I was a real estate investor, I'm trying to find homes off market. That's all we're doing is just finding those install opportunities off market. So that's the number two strong service department that's flipping leads to the sales department. Yeah, that's a great analogy. You know, real estate, if you're having to compete with other real estate agents to sell that same house, it's like sharks that are trying to compete for that house and it's, it's, it's harder because you got uh, not just the the homeowner and the the buyer you've got other real estate agents could create interference where when you get that off market real estate somebody came to you directly and you sold it to another person directly uh just much easier right and that, that tell me tell us about that tell us about the uh the service in uh in, in the sales team kind of coming together. I mean, you talk what you, we had at a table, we had that called the rat, the Boston rat pack. We had you, me, Steve, Akian, Rick Picard. Uh, and we had the Anthony mound on the table there at the restaurant we had there in Boston. And we, yeah. all we did is talk about lead turnovers again, getting that service and sales team together. Uh, tell me us about the impact of that meeting on you, on you, yeah, John. It, it's it's hard to even put in words because again, like seeing it from where it was nothing to where it's at now, um, yeah, it, it's it's a just a synergy. 
synergistic blend where you know it's again when it first started the guys were bad so they were like hey do you want a new furnace or you know okay cool i recommend you get a new furnace like i'm recommending you a new system so that was number one bad then it was like i'll have the office call you <laughs> so i'll leave <laughs> the office call you right and then the sales guy comes there and they're like i don't want a new furnace like you know i don't even know what that guy's talking about right mm -hmm. so again like developing that like okay let's get this process down where like I know you didn't even call me here for this. Do you even want to see these options? Like, yeah, like almost making them like, yeah, give it to me. Like, all right, I can bother, you know, I can, I could get my guy here, but he's busy. And, and are we going to get this done today? And I learned that from one of your podcasts from Rick Picard. And I'm like, that's, a, that's phenomenal. Like you shouldn't just be saying, yeah, let's get him here. Like, no, he's busy. Like, are we getting this done today? Okay, sure. Now I'll get him on the phone. And then when you're setting him up, setting him up for success, like, Hey, Kevin's on his way. Kevin is phenomenal. Probably one of the best people, you know, huge heart, you know, I love him to death. And then giving that personal deduction, hey, Joe, this is Kevin. Uh, remember, I told you he's a great guy. And then now you can't throw any smoke and say you weren't interested because I'm right here as a service tech. So now you have to uh, be honest, you know, and say, yeah, you know, he was interested in a new system. So having that process really dialed in where everybody knows their roles is, is crucial. That, that is great. You know, and I think, uh, you know, getting that strong service team. Sometimes people don't think that, hey, we're just going to sell installs. It's bigger numbers. But, you know, the the foundation of every company, I think, is that that concrete foundation that goes down 25 feet into the earth, uh, down to the bedrock, or in your case, in, in the state of Massachusetts is mostly granite, apparently. I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize <laughs> I didn't realize you can't heart this the black dirt just little dressing on top. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but the uh you know the bedrock is the service team, right? Would you say that's true there, John? Hundred percent. And and you know, talking, I mean, we've had tons of conversations before. And one of the things I learned from you was your service department can be way more profitable than install. And 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 one of the ways we do that is rejuvenation packages and bundled packages that you, first of all, you can't really shop around. You can't Google it. You can't ask another company for a rejuvenation. It's like, it's all this made up service that is exclusive to green energy mechanical. And so it really, it's like, I call it muddying the waters. You know, you might have two or three other people you might know or are interested in, but you can't get what we're, what we're going to give you. It's exclusive. Yeah. You got, uh, you got what you offer and then what 10 other people do. And they have to decide between the person who thinks they can take care of the whole thing or the person who's just going to nitpick and do the basic thing, right? That's really interesting. Jen, let's talk about you as a leader now, because <clears throat> after you build that service team who went out there and do the stuff, uh, who uh, got there and has the character, the competence, and the communication abilities himself, allowed you to step away. How important is that step three that the owner uh, really learns how to, for a job, it runs the business like an owner as opposed to a salesperson or a service tech himself? Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, for where I'm trying to go to, you know, there's a lot of people that still want to stay in a truck and and kind of keep their hand on everything. And what I've learned is I really need to fire myself out of the positions that are taking up the most amount of time. And for me, one of them was sales. It's hard because honestly, I love sales. Like I, I love this process. I, you know, um, you know, it, it's funny because one of my new guys I had, quick story, um, we were on a call and it was a lead turnover. I went there. Uh, you know, later at night, and I'm showing him how to make these things on code. And one of the things I talked to her about was our complete air treatment package, which is our indoor air quality package. And I told her, you know, I did this for you because I saw that you're on oxygen and I can tell clean air is extremely important to you. You know, she starts crying and <laughs> she was like, you have no idea. And she starts going into this whole story. And I was like, you know, shit, this is like his first experience of the lead turnover, he's probably going to think every single one of them goes like mm -hmm. this. It's like everybody's yep. crying and like, oh, you're amazing. But um, anyways, it's just, uh, yeah. So I've learned that like, I need to separate myself from those things. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to get to the next level. And so I have to constantly invest in myself and then turn that into my team. And then I can continue to step away out of different positions. I think, I think the uh, leaders like Kevin and other people in the office and who are helping to lead the team, that, that's the thing about it. The $10 million company, you're only limited to that growth by the amount of leaders you create. Would you agree, I agree with that? Yes, 100%. Yeah, there's no, it wouldn't even work if, if the leadership was bad, you know, and 
uh, all and the other thing I feel too is all the leaders have to be speaking the same language. Um, you know, I, I went to a ton of different trainings for for management, went to performance coach training, had goose uh, this is turning into like a service MVP uh, infomercial. I feel like, but <laughs> <laughs> well, the <a> few bits. <laughs> But it is what it is. I don't care. I tell everybody the same thing, you know, and uh, I was I was going to that class thinking it was going to be a uh, a sales coaching class. I didn't really didn't know what it was. And um, and that's actually how I met Steve Akeen. And I was uh, we, we were down there together and the class blew my mind. And I was like, this is the most simplest, easy, straightforward process that actually makes sense. Like and yeah, so now all my leadership, we all speak that same language. So you know, I tell them, they'll, let's say they start complaining about somebody and I'm like, stop complaining, start training. And they're like, I oh, know, stop complaining, start training. That's good. And it's, you know, it's like, I always say the first part of that is uh, the language of responsibility to say, uh, hey, this, uh, there's a gap we have in the company and that gap is on me. I, I, I didn't train the guys on what to do there. I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't coach them i saw they were trained but we never got them never watched or looked in on it i had a blind spot or whatnot uh how important is that element of it john to say uh like it's like the st- that's a good one i might have to lift that use that I'll, I'll quote you though i'll put your name on the quote stop complaining start training jonathan nevis put, is that okay if i borrow that one i'm with it yeah but i'll give you the i'll give you credit for all that one that's a good one because you know, what it tells me is that uh there's something that the leader has done Wrong, not, not that they fell short because exactly. they have not done the training and they have not completed the training or stuff like that. Uh, how important is it that uh, when you do train people, you test them and make sure that they are graduated uh, to get out there? Because that's what those achievements I see, all the kind of awards you get, they to me signify that people have graduated something, that they haven't just started the program and ended it without graduating. Wait, tell me about that, John, uh, about there, John. Yeah, that's how most of our trainings were before. It was just kind of like, yeah, I'm almost done. You know, or like I've I've got done. It's like okay, but like we have nothing on file. We have no. And, and the problem is, when that's when that happens, you can't hold them accountable. That's your fault, you know. And so, what are you going to say to someone if they say to you, "Well, I never was properly trained on that," you know? And so, when that happens, that's the first question. You know, like we'll be something will happen. Maybe a, a leadership will complain. Hey, we need to meet with so and so. First question. I'm like, hey, did you ever receive proper training on that? No. I'm stopping right there. I'm like, you know what? That's my fault. And what I found is your team is like, wow. Like they've never heard someone in management ever say that before. Like mm-hmm. we're going to stop right here. That's my fault. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get you the proper training. We're going to reassess and go from there. And it's 100% all about care. Like we care. Uh, that's the only reason why you'd even do that, you know? So well, I'm going to hit you with a surprise question here now. So yeah, just, really? uh, it's, uh, it's going to be one. You probably have the answer to it, I think, but hopefully you will. Uh, here, here's a question for you. What do you say to, what would you say to owners who say, I can't get my guys to sit down for a training or I can't get them, you know, my guys don't want to sit sit around in an office every day, uh, you know, jaw jacking and grab ass and they want to get out there and start using their hands and working. They, they want to get, we're too busy for the training, all the kind of excuses that people make for the training. What's your, what would be your response to those owners? What advice would you give them? I think for that, it would come to them, their leadership and really their vision. You know, I, I had um, an anonymous survey go out to my team because I thought everybody knew exactly what our vision was. And this was like maybe four or five months ago. And I was shocked at the answers. You know, like, what's your vision to deliver world class service? Like, no, that's not a vision. Like, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and so I was like, hey, you know what? Again, that's on me. I didn't do a great job at communicating exactly what our vision is because here's why I say that: when people know exactly what the vision is for the company and where they fit in, then they're going to have a huge appreciation for that training because they know that that training is going to help them get where they are to where they want to be, and so they become invested in it. And then my team all sees how heavily invested, I, I, you know, I spend a ton of money, uh, a ton of trips every year going to events. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's important for me. And so I, I just let them know, too, like they see that I lead by example with that. It's not like I'm saying, hey, and I think that's a bigger problem, too. I notice a lot of owners do that. They'll send someone to a training. They've never been to the training themselves. And if they are in the training, they're doing this the whole time in the back of the room on their phones not yep. listening and applying it. So I don't do that. If, if there's any training, I want to go to it first. So, so the advice would be, 
uh, if you can't get your, don't worry about your guys. You should get there first, and you get the training yourself. Then you train your guys. And truthfully, that's what real service looks like. The owner going somewhere, getting educated, and coming back and using that information to teach his team or to use the assets he's got there to teach the team. Because then people are like, oh, where's the owner? He's out there at some conference. But if you don't bring something back to the team from that, it's like, you know, when I remember a lot of people go on business trips, uh, you're supposed to bring back a little toy or something for your for your family. <laughs> bring back a T-shirt at least for your for your kids or whatever <clears throat> to make them think that I was thinking about you when I was doing that uh, yeah. business trip, right? I think the same thing is true with this. It's like you're going to go on a business trip uh, to go learn something. Let's bring something back for the team. This way they realize that, oh, I'm, I'm excited for John to go there as opposed to, oh, John's going there and just taking time off. Uh, you're going you're going there as a work trip right john it's not not, not a although you do have fun too uh, we all try to have fun but you know the uh the, the fact that you're going there you're going there to bring something back uh, would you agree with that yes 100 percent. that's the thing all right well john i think as usually a great podcast always starts on time and a great one i think goes a little longer which we did here just a little bit a couple minutes longer than we wanted to go but uh john do you have any final thoughts you want to share with anybody before we wrap it up no, I think we covered everything, you know, I just love to see people win. So, you know, let's not let's put all the noise away. And I, I hear a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt from different owners. It's all noise. Don't worry about that. Just focus on what's most important and serving people and you'll be fine. All right, everybody. Thank you so much, John. And thanks uh, to your team uh, for taking the information we teach and putting it in place. Uh, that's the biggest piece of it is actually using it, not just learning it. Uh, thank you so much, John. I appreciate you. Thank you.